Okay, here we are learning about scientific method for ACE Marine students. I gotta wet the whistle all the time, you know? Um, so I know you've probably learned scientific method before, but we're gonna take it up a notch, obviously, um, for ACE. So <clears throat> be prepared to use your guided notes and um, if you have any questions, of course I can pause the video, but try to write them down in the margin of your notes and I will um, answer them at the end, okay? All right. So, what is an explanation? What is a scientific explanation? Sorry. <laughs> Science is empirical. That means that it's based on experimentation. It's not just an opinion. Um, there's no such thing as opinions in science. Everything is tested, testable, and factual, okay? It's not subjective. So it's objective. You have to look at it unbiased and without any preconceived notions. And any phenomenon that you study has to be measurable. That's why we talk about measurement all the time in science, which we're going to learn more about um, later. Now, <clears throat> here's some examples of phenomenon that cannot be measured. Mrs. Is Miss, Mrs. Castellano the best principal ever? You can say that she is, but is it measurable with what you say? You'd actually have, what would you have to do? You'd have to get evidence. You'd have to get numbers something measurable. Do you have any marine examples? Like, last time you were at the beach, did you have any questions about where does the sand come from? Or why is the ocean so salty? Okay, you can answer these with measurable experimentation, but um, there are many ways that you can't. Uh, there are many questions that can't be measured um, and they're just based upon opinions, okay, or subjective. So, all explanations must be consistent with known natural laws and well-established. So, that they have to have well-documented existing theories. We're going to talk about theories later, okay, and laws. Objectively, like I said, from independently confirmable observations and retested procedures, not just tested once, but tested multiple times by different scientists getting the same answer, and then we can be fairly reliant on that information. Because just tested one time, uh, they could have made mistakes. So we need to get the same results, right? And then tentative. All scientific knowledge must be regarded as tentative. That means for now. This is the way it is for now, but if new information comes, it's going to change what we, what we come up with, okay? That's why, uh, it's really funny, you may have heard the, the joke about doctors and how they practice medicine. Well, if they're practicing, I don't want them practicing it on me, right? Or my practice, my law practice, my, my medical practice, okay? That's because everything's changing. And as it changes, they learn more and get better, okay? And we get more informative, okay? That's what the word practice, that's what that means. Tentative. <clears throat> so what is the process of science? Hey, scientific method. We are aware of this from previous science classes. Especially if you're an upperclassman, okay? Because you've had this many times, probably every year. Um, but we're going to apply it all to marine science now. So, orderly, pattern, you have to follow the steps. There is a quiz on this on Friday, okay? <clears throat> Two types of reasoning. One is inductive. That is, um, without any previous knowledge, you are, you see something happen and you, you induce the cause or the explanation behind it. Okay, um, your classmate runs in the door, sweating. <laughs> Mr. Keene, I'm sorry I'm late. In your mind, you're instantly thinking, what was happening? 
why is that person all sweaty, like soaked, you know, sweaty? Did they come from PE? Did they just get in a fight with a, with a boyfriend or girlfriend? Um, was it raining out? I mean, multiple things could happen, right? So you're basing this on no prior knowledge, you are coming up with reasons why, okay? Now, the opposite of that, or not the opposite, I guess, is called deductive reasoning. Think Sherlock Holmes, okay? And believe it or not, I actually found a picture of Benedict Cumberbatch on a boat, because he plays Sherlock Holmes. Anyway, um, with nets and everything, so it was, I, was, I was pretty impressed with myself when I found that. Um, so this is based on prior knowledge. So it's type of reasoning that allows you to assume certain facts are true and then predict why something has happened. So perhaps that student ran in who's all sweaty and you knew that they had PE last period or you knew that they were having uh, problems in their relationship or you knew what the weather outside was, okay? And that's why. So that's deductive reasoning. Oh, they are wet because of, okay? <clears throat> now, here are the steps of the scientific method, and you have to get these down in your notes, obviously. Um, and you've seen them before. There are six basic steps. So some teachers add some little extra ones or even delete one, but this is the basic six steps that you have to know and that we're going to constantly refer to throughout the school year, okay? So observation. What did I see? What did I smell? What did I taste? What did I touch? What did I hear? I sensed something in the universe and I want to know more about it. I made an observation. Why does that, why does that um, shark have five gills instead of six gills? Why does um, that albatross feed its young this species of fish and not that species of fish? Okay, so an albatross is like a Great big seagull, sort of. Um, so that's the first thing. And then you're gonna do research. Research is the second step. So you don't just come up with a hypothesis because that would be based on inductive reasoning. We want to be deductive. We want some prior background knowledge. So we're going to get that by doing step two, gathering data and researching. So let's go back to the sharks. I've got a five gill shark and a six gill shark. We're gonna learn about that. Um, why does this shark have six gills and not five gills like most other sharks? So you would research it and see if anybody else came up with that answer or to see what information is out there about it. And then you would come up with your own question. You would formulate a question, which is making a hypothesis. Well, this shark has, or let's go back to the albatross, um, this, the albatross eats these fish because those fish are too small or those fish um, are too deep in the water for the albatross to get. And so you would, you would come up with a possible explanation to your observation, okay? And going back to, the, to research, the inference, okay? Um, there are qualitative descriptions, qualities color, shape, um, things like that, smell, feel the texture, okay? And then there are quantitative, which are objective, measurements, numbers, which is what you would need in uh, mainly, okay, for, for this process. And then once you have your hypothesis, you can test it. It has to be a testable hypothesis. Something that's untestable are those opinions before that we give, like Mr. Keene's the best teacher in the school, which in maybe some ways I am, I can admit, but certainly there are other teachers who are better at other things than I am. So that's, that's not really, you can't really measure it, okay? So it has to be testable. Um, and then you perform that cont controlled experiment. That's the test. Once you perform the experiment and you get and you collect your data, then you can organize the data, like in graphs and charts and things like that. And then once it's organized, you can analyze the data because now it's all in order. And then once you analyze it, you come up with a solution, not a solution, a conclusion, um, which then you would share with others. Communicate. The purpose of this is to take some complex idea that you have and 
be able to share it out into the universe with all the other people, interested people, um, to make them more knowledgeable, okay? About the universe around them. Okay, so here's another example. You observe a great white shark in South Africa hunting seals, okay? And it jumps out of the water to catch the seal. So your observation is that these white sharks are hunting by jumping out of the water. Now, without doing any research at all, do you think you can come up with a hypothesis? Not, you're not supposed to, but can you? And sure you can. The hypothesis would be something simple like, um, it's three parts, we'll talk more about that in a minute, but if great white sharks do this, I'm not gonna complete it for you because we're gonna work on that later. Then, that's the second part, if then, then this will happen. So if they jump, then they'll catch more seals because, and that because part, that third part, is so important in your description of a hypothesis, in your formulation of a hypothesis, okay? If, then, because. You have to explain why. Because otherwise they wouldn't catch seals. And so you'd have to be out there in a boat with binoculars measuring the number of instances that you see this happen compared to times when they catch seals not jumping, and then compare those two. Graph, bar graph one, bar graph two, whichever one's the highest, if there's a great enough difference, then you have answered your question. Either way, you've answered your question. Maybe they're equal, maybe they're very similar. They catch them just as many times jumping or not jumping, and then you've got your answer also. And they don't, they can, but they don't have to, okay? So it's all about measurement, all right? So, controlled experiment. You have to have two groups. You have to have the control group, which nothing is done to. They, they use it as a baseline for comparison. So um, if you're measuring the albatross catching fish, you would have a control group that you wouldn't change anything to, okay? And for the other one, so you wouldn't do anything. Leave them au naturel, okay? And it's used as a reference to ensure that your results are not by chance, okay? And then you'd have your experimental groups, your independent variable. This is the thing that you change in an experiment to see what happens. Very simple, if I had some plants, five plants in a pot, okay? Um, in pots, five pots, and I left one of them alone with the same light, same amount of water as the other one, the same air temperature, but the other ones, I changed the independency, change the independent variable by adding more and more nitrogen to those four other plants. I leave one alone, everything else is the same, controlled, okay, controlled. They're all controlled, but one is controlled more than the others, okay? And then the other ones I apply the independent variable to, okay? So, Here's another example, a hypothesis to test, okay? Here's a marine example. If sea stars, we say sea stars, not starfish. Let me see if I can get an example over here. All right, there's one. So you've all seen a sea star, okay? This is a little one, um, very common in North, eastern waters, not so much common down here. I was snorkeling a couple weeks ago and I found one of those Bermuda stars, those big giant five-legged ones. Um, this is also five-legged, but there are other like nine-legged sea stars and other ones all around here. So very cool. Um, so we're talking about sea stars now, right? Not starfish, because they're not fish. Not a fish, okay, very important. Um, so if sea stars are present in an environment, then the number of mussels will decrease. And you'd have to write because at the end of that. This is missing the because part. Why, based upon your research, do you think it will decrease, okay? And so you'd have a control group, <clears throat> which is just the sea stars. I mean, sorry, just the mussels. <laughs> 
these are supposed to be muscles, okay? And you have the experimental group where you add C stars. You put C stars and then you see what happens. So if they're present, the muscles will decrease. That's my hypothesis. Because why? Because C stars eat muscles, okay? It's really interesting. We're going to learn more about this, but they have very powerful um, suction cup feet, little tiny feet that pry open the shell like this much. And then they, this is gross, they eviscerate, bleh, they throw up their stomach out of their mouth and put it inside the clam or the muscle and they digest it like that. It's wild. I had it happen in a fish tank once at my house and it totally wrecked the fish tank. Um, so, all right, another example. Um, here we have some grass. Let's call it, well, it's salt marsh plants. That's part of marine science, salt marshes. So um, in the estuaries, I grew up in the salt marsh estuaries of the south um, shore of Long Island in New York. I actually wrote a memoir about it. It's being published um, as we speak on Long Island. Um, I'll tell you how you can get a copy. So um, the salt marsh, so why, here's your observation. Why do salt marsh plants in some areas grow larger than in other areas? Well, I want to know this. Maybe it's not important, but when we talk about estuaries, I will explain why it's important to you. Because we have estuaries here um, in the barrier beaches, on the, other, on the intercoastal side of the barrier beaches, right here in Boca and all along the coast, all along the east coast and the west coast. It's pretty, pretty cool and very important for humans' existence. So, so the more we know, the better we're gonna be. So here you have short grass, low nutrient input, high nutrient input, okay? And the soil examples, the soil samples have low nitrogen versus high nitrogen. Um, so that's your observation and your questions. Now you're going to formulate a hypothesis. This is using inductive, not deductive. So this is without any prior knowledge, okay? So the growth of marsh grass is limited by nitrogen availability. So then they're going to use deductive reasoning after doing some research to make a prediction. And that's the only way you can truly make a hypothesis, okay, is by doing the research first. This is not good enough. You need to do the research. And then, so here's your hypothesis. If, then, and then you would have to add the because at the end. And we're going to practice that. If nitrogen is added to the soil, then marsh grass will grow larger or faster or both. I don't like that. Well, that, well you have to choose one. <laughs> That's not a good example. You have to pick one. You can't say anything can happen. That's pretty bad. And then you design an experiment and you actually do the experiments, okay? So you've got a control plot where you do nothing. They actually have two control plots versus two experimental plots, okay? Where they're adding nitrogen fertilizer to the salt marsh grasses, grasses to see if they're gonna change. Then you gather the results. How hard is it to gather the results? You typically take a tape measure and you measure the length of the plant. Simple, it's actually very simple. But you have to get out there and do it. And then you repeat the experiments and you draw, once you repeat it and you get the same results, then you can draw conclusions, okay? Now let's practice a little bit. This is data that was collected on two factors over um, 150 years, okay? And the two factors are concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere versus temperature. Now immediately you can see something. You can see a correlation between those two pieces of data, okay? So what variables were measured here? And I just told you, concentration of carbon dioxide and temperature. What is the relationship? What can you, so you've done the experiment, you've done all the steps, now you're at part six, conclusion. What can you say about your conclusion? You've, now you have to analyze the data. And you can simply say that as temperature goes up, concentration of carbon dioxide also goes up. It's obviously related somehow. They may not be the cause of each other. There may be some other factor involved, but 
This is just saying that they do happen together, okay? <clears throat> and then you'd provide purpose supported by hypothesis. And then you could also talk about future studies. What would you do next? What would you do next now that you know this? Okay? How could you further this study? So um, when you're writing your conclusion, you have to support your conclusion by talking about data in your collected, data collected, okay, from your typically from a graph or a chart. So here's one that was here's an actual study with the sea star, Pisaster. Um, that's the, the um, genus name of this sea star here. Um, this one is um, Asterius, okay. So this one's on the, um, I believe, the west coast of North America, off. Oregon and Washington and Northern California. And this, this little guy is from the Northeast coast of uh, North America. Okay. So you see they're bigger, redder, anyway. So the, this guy Payne, he wanted to discover the relationship between sea star population and muscle population and what effects that would have on other local fauna, fauna being animals, Flora would be plants, okay? So what effect does starfish have removal? That should say sea star, not starfish, um, have on, co on community structure, okay? So in other words, if you remove sea stars, or I, mean, I, could, I could apply this to anything. I could apply this to the Everglades. If I remove alligators, what's going to happen to the population of the community structure, you know, a population of the other organisms. If I go out to the, to the, um, the Great Plains and I remove wolves, which was done, but they're being replaced now, um, what would happen to the community structure? Not just the community, but the geology. There's a whole story, look it up if you're interested. By removing the wolves from the Great Plains, it change the course of a river. Really kind of amazing. I'm going to leave you with that. By removing wolves, change the course of a river. Okay, so he removed the sea stars, the top predator from the environment, from an experimental site, and did, did that every, oops, every week for two years, okay? Um, and then he monitored 15 different species on an experimental plot. And after five years, there were only two species, okay? Species diversity reduction was likely due, he concluded, to competitive exclusion. So they competed each other out for food. Same if you take the alligators away, the things that the alligator eats are going to explode in population, and then they will die off because they run out of food. They run out of resources. So the alligators maintain that. The wolves maintain that. The sea stars, all keystone species, he coined that term, um, Robert Payne. Keystone species are all important to the ecosystem and the ecological relationship of that community. Okay? Um, so he did this 30 years ago. And in the, yeah, see, the coast of Washington State in, on the Pacific Coast. So... And he found, very simply, he did this um, the section with the control, the um, number of species was great, but that, that was the control, sorry. The number of species population uh, diversity was great. Without, the, the diversity plummeted down to two. So, very good experiment, very good example. So what is a theory versus a law? This is the last part of our notes, okay? A lot of times people use these words and they don't quite know what they're saying, theory versus law. So we're gonna cover this really quick, okay? Because I know you've done this before in other classes. So a theory explains observed facts. But here's, here's the kicker with a theory basis for future discussion or investigation, meaning there's more that we don't know. There's more that can happen. Theories change when the facts change. 
For example, the theory of plate tectonics. When we find out more about plate tectonics, which we're going to learn about in this class as it pertains to oceans, um, we're going to see that we don't know everything. We're learning more all the time. The theory of genetics. In biology class, um, you'll learn that. Theory of evolution, same, okay? Explains why phenomenon occur. A law, on the other hand, is a theoretical principle deduced from facts. And they're typically written mathematically, okay? They're mathematical representations. So it explains how nature behaves. Here's some examples. Gravity, the law of gravity, right? We're all experienced with that. Motion, Newton's laws of motion, and the conservation of mass. If I have a chemical reaction, the mass of the reactants must equal the mass of the products. Now, contrary to common misunderstanding, okay, they do not become the other. A theory does not always become a law. Sometimes, but many people think, oh, that if you prove a theory enough, it becomes a law. That's not true, okay? So if you see this, I believe this um, will be in your notes. Um, theory explains why law summarizes a set of observations about a natural phenomenon. They're both based on hypotheses, and they both can be used to make predictions, and they both can be revised, okay? So here's some facts, here's some laws to compare the two again. And we're talking about plate tectonics, huh? so I'm introducing this here, but we're going to talk about this more in the future. There's a whole unit in our book about this. So, layers of the Earth are in constant motion. That's a fact. The crust is composed of numerous plates, about 35. We are sitting on the North American plate, but we're really close to the Caribbean plate. And the movement of tectonic plates results in earthquakes, movement of land masses, and volcanoes and mountains. Okay, um, there's a YouTube channel that's currently showing the Icelandic volcano, the live one. It's a live feed, and it's really cool. I check it every once in a while because it's cool to see a volcano erupting, not just on some video from many years ago, but currently and live, making new earth. It's pretty cool. New land. So here's some laws. Law of deformation. Law of tecton tectonism. Law of orogenesis. Law of seafloor spreading. So... Facts help to make the laws, okay? Now, I don't expect you to know too much about this right now. Just know that these are examples that we're going to talk about more in the future. Okay, so here's one theory in depth and how it came about. Um, new facts changed it, okay? I'm going to do an article about this, I believe, um, after the notes. If not today, tomorrow. So, Darwin's theory of coral atoll formation. We're going to learn more about what an atoll is in depth, even more in depth than this, but um, this is just an example. Okay, so here's a volcanic mountain, and this is coral reef fringing the volcanic mountain, okay, in the middle of the ocean. So in 1831, uh, Darwin, his quote is up on the board, up, over the board up there. If you notice, there are several quotes from famous scientists around here. Um, in 1831, he took the HMS Beagle and he journeyed out. The red is out. He went all the way to South America and out to the Galapagos Islands. And then he journeyed back around the whole world. New Zealand, Australia, the island of Tasmania, around Madagascar, around the Horn of Africa, back over here again. I don't know why he went over there. but And then he went back to England and sat in his office for years creating a book, which is over there. Um, his whole theory of evolution book is over there, okay? So he recorded them, published in 1842, revised in 72, and then it wasn't accepted until the late 1950s. That's insane. That's an entirely different story. So what are some of his observations pertaining to this coral atoll? He made lots of observations. We're just talking about the mountain with the fringe of coral around the outside, okay? He saw small islands of low circular coral reefs within deep waters. Now, how did these get here? How do you get coral that's supposed to live in 
water that has light to grow in these deep water. How'd they get there in these deep water regions? Something must have happened. So coral reefs exist in shallow water and grow upward. Not, they, don't, they don't start in deep water and grow upward. So he said that volcanic islands sunk in the center. He must have, must have 3D cylindrical shape since the reef is connected. A round mountain, 3D cylindrical, okay? Based on the reef, must sink as the reef continues to grow. Okay, reef began growing from circular landform volcanic islands. These are, these are what he, he inferred based upon his observations. And the volcanic islands must sink. He said sink, they don't really sink, they erode over time when they stop. So check it out. So here's your volcanic volcano <laughs> um, with coral reef. So the volcano erupted from deep in the ocean. It made a mountain. Okay, the ocean's like down here. It made a mountain. And then because the edge of the mountain was, was in shallow water, the coral landed there and said, we, we can live here, okay? It's called a fringing reef. Now over time, the, the um, volcano erodes away, leaving this barrier reef, all right, which is separated from the land by a lagoon. And then finally, when the mountain's gone, you get something called an atoll or an atoll. I like atoll better. Anyway, it's a coral ring with a central lagoon and the mountain's gone now, totally eroded away. And this is over time, okay? All right, so these arrows are showing you um, the direction. So the amount of encircled landmass decreases as you go this way. The elevation of the encircled landmass um, decreases as you go this way. And the amount of the enclosed lagoon increases as you go in that direction, okay? That's all that's showing. <clears throat> so if a volcano risen from the ocean floor becomes extinct, it erodes. And it creates a substrate, meaning if I went to the bottom of the water, the ocean or the intercoastal, and I just dug up some sand or mud with my hand, that's the substrate. That's what substrate means. So the eroding land creates substrate here for baby planktonic corals to attach to and start growing. <clears throat> and then you get this barrier reef. Here's the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, one of the largest reefs in the world, coral reefs. Um, and so the coral reef builds upward, keeping a pace with the rising sea levels. So if sea levels rise, the reef keeps building up. Sometimes if it rises too fast, it can't keep up and will get covered by too much water and not enough light and the coral reef dies. We'll talk more about that in the future. And then you get this atoll, okay? And this is an example of one. This is called the blue hole in Belize, although that, this, that may also be a sinkhole, but they're not quite sure about that one. I'm not sure if that's a very good example. Um, and then as the sub subsidence continues, the reef completely encloses the sunken volcanic island and encircles the lagoon. So here's the midway in Hawaii, uh, on the end of Hawaii, like here's, the Hawaiian Islands everyone's familiar with, and then way out here is this island called Midway. And um, this is a very good example of what used to be a larger structure here, mountain, now eroded. And you can see all the creatures that live on that atoll. Okay. More supporting evidence observations are needed. That's what the article that we're going to be talking about next comes in, okay? If not today, then tomorrow, or both. Um, plate tectonics and subsidence. When volcanic areas are active, they are very warm and so have low density. Thus, they often reach the surface to form islands. As volcanic regions cool, they become more dense and sink. So, you see that it's eroding, okay? And Darwin's theory could not have been verified during this time. This, that's what he said. Okay, um, 
Now, technology has advanced since his time back in the 1800s. And so in 1947, they actually drilled a hole into the rock, okay, into the Bikini Atoll, whose samples showed the process occurred in exactly the sequence that Darwin had induced so many years, 100 years ago, okay? Um, and they hit volcanic rock at the bottom. So they know that a volcano was once there, and that's why we know that this occurred. So new facts, theories become changed. New facts come, new technology comes, advancements in technology and in thinking in general um, make, new, make the theories change, okay? That was the whole point here. So this is the last slide. Um, so just more supporting as evidence. We didn't, he didn't know about this. He didn't know that um, corals, which are animals, um, they have these symbiotic algae called zooxanthellae, which we're going to learn about in here. We'll say zox for short. Um, but zooxanthellae, they, they have to grow near the water's surface in order to um, help corals make food. Okay? Corals are animals that, because of this symbiotic relationship, are partially photosynthetic, like plants, okay? Um, so over time, the skeleton subsides to create the interconnected, the connected reef, which we call an atoll. And so the zooxanthellae required, are required to make that skeleton happen. And so they have to be near the surface of the water to get enough light. So if they... Um, if that didn't happen, then Darwin's theory would, have, would not have been correct. But he didn't know about it. So when we learned about it, humans, humankind, scientists, right? When we learned about it many years later, by doing microscopic studies of the cellular tissue of a, of a coral animal, um, we were able to apply that information, that new factual information, to Darwin's theory and support the theory with more evidence, okay? Big, long example, and I hope it uh, made sense to you. If not, please, um, when I stop the video, raise your hand and ask a question, okay? That is all.